Um, so welcome to an evening with Jim McGowan. Uh, good morning to those of you who are just getting up bright and early. Some people are joining us in the afternoon and other people, good evening. Um, I'm Jackie Nishaw, I'm chairman of the Guild Events Committee. And as I've said, we've got over 200 attendees expected tonight from various locations across the world. And we also welcome some non-members this evening. So thank you very much to everybody for joining us. This is our fifth An Evening With session, and they were suggested by members who wanted us to host a virtual modelling topic each month. So the 26th of every month, we have a topic for you, except in December, because people might be otherwise occupied. Um, and tonight, as you know, we're joining Jim McGowan, who's telling us all about his journey from Dole Q to becoming his own man and obviously owning connoisseur models, which is a well-known range of brass etched kits. Um, before we start, I just need to do a few reminders about the setup for the evening. In terms of housekeeping, I hope that everybody managed to read the specific Zoom instructions which were sent out in advance. Um, we are recording this evening, so if you don't want your image to appear on the recording or on screen, you can turn off your video by going to the toolbar at the bottom of the screen. And you can also change your name by clicking on the name beside your photograph, your image. We have muted everybody now because obviously, as you can imagine, with um, 160 people we've now got present, the noise in the background would be quite disruptive. Um, hopefully at the end of the meeting, we might be able to ask people to unmute and ask personal questions. But in the meantime, if you would like to ask a question, if you take your cursor to the very bottom of the page, you'll find a little icon that says chat. If you press on that, you will get a um, screen at the side, sometimes it's at the bottom, and it should say to everyone. And then if you type the message at the bottom, a bit like texting people, that will obviously give you the information on screen to everybody. Um, Tony is my co-host this evening, so whilst I'm talking to Jim with some of the questions we've had in advance, Tony will be capturing any questions that are popping up in the chat. So please feel free to send any questions via the chat and we'll pick those up for you. The other thing to mention is that we've spotlighted Jim, so you should all see Jim on screen, um, which means that you don't have to switch between gallery view and speaker view. So whenever anybody's talking, it doesn't matter who's saying anything, Jim is the one who you will see. And as I mentioned, Tony Kell, who's vice chairman of events, is our co-host tonight and will be taking it in turns with me to ask questions. Our aim is to finish at 9.30. Um, towards the end, as I said, if we can, we'll bring people in for live chat. Um, we'll go through and explain how that will work later. Um, but that should be everything to do with housekeeping. So let's get started. Before tonight, you should have had the link to watch the video when I had the pleasure of going to Northampton Society of Model Engineers, where I'm a member and I was able to meet Jim in the grounds of the engineering um, railway. Due to COVID, we couldn't meet inside, so I was very grateful to Ian Allen, who came over from Northampton. He's our overseas representative and also part of our video team. And he came and filmed the session and obviously very grateful to members of Northampton Society of Model Engineers and the chairman there for providing the location. Um, and not to forget that Jim travelled over from Herefordshire so that we could actually do that interview. Um, thankfully, we can now meet inside. So Jim's not sitting in the garden. He's actually um, in a friend's studio in Herefordshire. And thank you, Steve, for providing the Zoom facilities for Jim tonight. Um, and we will get started. And Jim, welcome. Um, a few queries obviously have popped up since the interview. 
And I know one of the things we wanted to start with was just to try and explain a bit more about the photo etching process, which you use to create your brass kits. And I know you want to tell us a bit more about that. So if we could start with that, I think that's going to answer quite a few questions for people. <laughs> well, I'm ever so pleased that you have asked about that because uh, I explained it at Northampton and then I sort of pre-watched the... Uh, the video uh, afterwards and I looked at it and I thought well I hope it's clear to everybody else because I've pretty much confused myself in uh, explaining that so the opportunity to go through it again uh, would be absolutely excellent now really uh, as a kit producer in some ways the etching process almost happens by magic to us in the same way as Stephen King would probably not be able to tell you much about book printing. He just sort of says, my latest uh, sort of bestseller just appears by magic. Uh, so, yeah, to a, to a certain extent, we leave it up to, to the etchers. Uh, so I am perhaps not the most knowledgeable uh, about what actually happens. I mean, I mean, basically, to a certain extent... We don't really want us inside their factory messing about and getting in their way uh, uh, and that lot. So, uh, so, so what I say is how I interpret it to me. Uh, but what what I have looked at, uh, and what I would recommend before we sort, of get, I give you how I understand it to know that it, it's there. Uh, but basically, the there's uh, the etching, the, the main etchers are based in the West Midlands, uh, of which there's two of them that tend to deal most with the model work, the model railway work. I am pretty much exclusively with the firm Photo Etch Consultants, who I've been with for many, many years. The, the other firm is a firm called Grange and Otter. Uh, which many other kit manufacturers use. Uh, now, Grange and Odder, on their website, present an absolutely excellent sort of guide of what is photo etching. And they go into detail, and they go into, uh, uh, you know, you can request a more further information if you sort of fancy having a go at the process and that lot. So, so really, uh, if... What anybody wanted to get the actual detail from the etcher's point of view, I would recommend a visit on Grange and Odder's uh, stand uh, 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 website. And and certainly it means that I can sort of go on now, but you don't necessarily have to remember anything. You can sort of re revisit it later. Right. So as, as I say, as far as I'm concerned with the etching process, I, I use the firm Photo Edge Consultants. I've used them since 1988 uh, when they first uh, sort of set up. And the first part from me uh, is to actually create an artwork. Uh, and uh, that is my design. Uh, now, the artwork is, uh, and, and I'll. I'll I've got an example here. I, ba I basically brought, brought along uh, a piece of graphic artwork. This is from 1988. This was my first loco kit, uh, the Y7. Uh, and you know, now things have moved on. Uh, most people are creating their artworks digitally now uh, with sort of AutoCAD programs and that lot. Uh, Although I still take in a, uh, a pasted up uh, physical piece of artwork to go on the copy camera. But this is how it was done back in 1988, sort of in the very traditional days. And what the kit designer did, uh, as you can see, was literally draw out everything that was wanted as parts. Uh, you're working on different colors. The white, as you can perhaps imagine, uh, this is the foot plate. Uh, so the white is what's going to be the metal. The black is what's going to be etched away as uh, full etch. So in a way, you're actually drawing the spaces around the parts 
not the parts for cells. Uh, then where you want half etch detail on the front, uh, you're using a color red. Where you want half etch detail on the rear, you, you're using the color blue. Produce a piece of artwork, this then goes into the etchers. Uh, and normally, sort of once you pass it through the door, that's probably as much as uh, we deal directly with the process. Uh, and that lot. So the etcher will take my artwork. This would then go on to a copy camera and actually be photographed uh, to produce a pair of, well, a, a, initially positives, uh, uh, sorry, initially negatives and then positives, which produce the photo tool. Why, uh, or the way we achieve getting two different tool, tools for the top surface edge and the bottom surface edge is by actually putting filters on the on the camera that go blind to the red and right, blind to the blue. So you, you get a top and a bottom tool. Now I've brought along a photo tool. Uh, this is one I've got in the drawer. Most of my O-gauge tools are in with the etcher uh, at the moment, but this, uh, this is actually uh, a gauge one brake man, which never really got put into production uh, and that lot. But by its size, uh, it should be easier to see. So I was actually showing you the back uh, of the tool there. This is the front of the tool. Uh, and as you can perhaps sort of see from it, pick out the traditional design of an edge kit with its plan details, its fold lines and that lot. Uh, and what I've done is I've actually slipped a piece of card between the two films. Uh, so if we can perhaps imagine the card is the sheet of brass, which is coated with a photographic resist, the, tool, the two arms of the tool are put either side of it, that then goes on to the light bed where there is bottom lamps and uh, a top comes down with top lamps and is photographically exposed, exposed to light. Then the sheets are developed and where the light is it, the, uh, the, the resist, that goes on where the black is, no lights hit it, that gets washed away. So you end up with a sheet of brass that's covered with a resist uh, that can then go through the etching machine. Uh, what I also brought along is a sheet as it comes out the etching machine uh, or the finished sheet that I'll be picking up from, from the etchers uh, and that. So if you imagine you've got a sheet of brass uh, this will pass through the etching machine uh, on a roll bed and through uh, a, a set of sprays and it will pass through and as it passes through the, the sprays it will probably remove about two thousandths of an inch of material as it goes through there's another fella at the other end of the machine he grabs takes it off nimbly nips down to the end of the machine and he'll perhaps turn it the other side and pass it through that where it will remove another couple of thou, do the same. And they keep passing through until the components actually pierce through. Uh, it, it, it's, it's an and an eye process. Uh, what you'll probably get is if you find it's etching a little bit too much over one side on, on another pass, they'll reverse the sheet and it'll then even out. Uh, not not sort of dissimilar, I suppose, to slowly developing out a uh, out a photograph where uh, in the old uh, darkroom days uh, you'd, you'd actually sort of fog something over to just stop a, a bit coming over etching or over developing uh, and that one. So, but very very similar process. Brilliant. It's really interesting. I think one of the things I'm finding from these evenings, and, and I say the same about the one Andy did, is we're seeing the whole process behind the scenes for manufacturing, you know, the white metal casting, the brass etching, 
Um, and I'm finding it very interesting because you build a kit and you don't actually realise and appreciate the amount of work that's gone on behind the scenes. So thank you very much for that. And we will give everybody the link for the Grange and Hodge the website at the end so that you can have a look at their very good explanation about um, brass etching. It, it, put, it puts it into context and... Uh... Yeah, I, I, I was actually directed towards it uh, by somebody who uh, had watched the video and that lot. And I sort of, and when I read it, and I thought, well, yeah, that, that, that's that. That's crystal clear and in a few words. Uh, um, but in fact, I learned a lot from it. So, uh, yeah, yeah, this is what it's all about. Excellent. Um, Jim, there's a collection of questions which oh, are all of a similar vein. Um, so I'm going to start with one which is very, very common, which is the question about what has made you decide on certain models? Um, what has influenced you? Were you a trained spotter as a child? Is it your favourite company? Um, what's actually influenced you in terms of the kits that you have gone for? Right. My, my personal modelling interest uh, was very... Uh, but by the time it got to certainly the old gauge uh, time of things, was very light railway -y, Colonel Stevens light railway -y, also sort of East Anglian, LNER, uh, and, uh, and that lot. So, so that was where my particular interest was. What actually influenced the first kits, uh, which was really to try and provide me with sets of parts that I could build as finished models, was the fact that I actually acquired uh, uh, the beginnings of a few kits from uh, Roger Crumblow, who actually had R and R models, which goes back years. He, uh, you know, some of the very first uh, sort of etch kits that were available. Uh, there was a man in Wardley produced, uh, and he also produced a Y seven uh, and a, a range of castings uh, and that lot, and uh, for. Basically, I managed to acquire uh, uh, the resources, the patterns, uh, the, the casting patterns for a couple of kits from, from his range. Well, I got the, uh, the patterns for the, an LNER Y7, which he, he had actually produced as an R&R &R kit. And also in the range of castings were some great Western bogies. Uh, and so from those, that... De determine the first kits to produce. Well, my first kit I produced was the Great Western McCaw B, and that actually happened uh, because I got a set of bogies. But, you know, not dissimilar to a lot of scratch builders that sort of, you know, ferret round the box or have a look on the bring and buy, come away with a set of bogies, perhaps find another pack of buffers and think, right, what can I build round it and that? Lot? Well, yeah, I mean, that determined the first kit, but you know, I, I've got some castings towards it. The rest of the casting masters uh, was simple enough that I could scratch build them, fabricate them, uh, uh, and that lot. Uh, so, yeah, that, that sort of gave the direction for producing the McCall B. Uh, obviously, I've got the Y7, a almost full set of uh, castings for the basic Y7. Uh, fittings that uh, was was how the kit came and I actually had Roger's original artwork uh, now Ro Roger was a fantastic uh, draftsman graphic artist uh, of that lot and obviously we know that, that from his original Brumtrams range of card kits when he did the alpha graphic kits and that lot so you can imagine his approach to the artwork and uh, and the instructions I found very, very inspirational and his, uh, his method of construction as well. Although, as it happened, the artwork, because it was something that was developed uh, in the very early days of etching, uh, where there was no, no surface etching in that lot, wasn't actually usable, but it gave me the inspiration and the guide to produce the Y7 artwork for my first kit so that's pretty much where the first two came from uh and once you've got a couple certainly once i've got the y7 uh and that was selling okay 
you then start looking at your fittings uh, and, and think to yourself, well, you know, virtually the same set of castings could be used on a J79. So the J79 kit came along. And then you start stirring around and you think, well, if I have, just have a new chimney and a new, uh, uh, I think it was a dome, I needed a dome, you know, but for, for two extra patterns, uh, which a fella did for us, then came the J71. So I'd suddenly done three small northeastern tank locos uh, that was sort of like, although northeastern, they was light railway too, uh, and that lot. So that moved me in the direction. Uh, the Y6 tram loco, uh, I wanted to do because I was familiar with it. It was one of the first things I had to scratch build on, scratch build view. And again, all the fittings was within my capability of actually uh, fabricating the masters from. So again, why, you know, the little tram loco. So again, I'm going more down the, the light railway route. And that obviously must have got that sort of level where it then got traction that customers are buying it. And then the customers are making the suggestion and the customers then pretty much started leading me uh, in, in, in the direction. So yeah, a, a lot of it's been customer based or like the specialist line societies such as the Great Eastern Society, uh, they had got uh, a lovely range of drawings and information and a fantastic fella, John Gardner, who used to, uh, who's passed away now, but he, he was Wolverhampton, but John was uh, actually a Stratford apprentice uh, uh, at that, and he uh, produced loads and loads of model makers' drawings for the GE Society. For, for, for the Line Society, the GE Society, I think, serve information the best. And they started feeding information in. And if somebody comes along and says, how about you? And you go, well, oh, I've not got a lot of that lot. And then we go, well, how about, and here's all the drawings, and here's all the photos, and here's everything you need. It suddenly makes the job easy. Uh, and really, you'd be a prat not to follow through. And then once you've done the kit, the society quite happily go around promoting it to all their members because it's the sort of kit that their members wanted. So, yeah, yeah there's a synergy to it all, I thought. So certainly if people are looking for um, models in the future, having drawings, photographs and lots of background information is helpful in terms of influencing that system of, of working through the process. Right, right. I, I, I perhaps will have to just sort of put, put a little bit of caution or make it. That, that was... That was good in the early days when I was when I was a single man and uh, I, I'd sort of sit there working at the drawing board to four or five o'clock in the morning and I've got nothing in that lot. Uh, yeah, and it didn't, didn't take an awful lot, you know, somebody would give you a drawing and so a bit of info and you think, well, I'll sit up tonight and, you know, all inspired and do it. Sadly, I don't seem to have that, <laughs> that time now. And so, so the list of wonderful things it would be nice to do is so much longer and so much beyond the capacity of what will be done now. So, you know, uh, I, I'd hate to lead anybody on with those, but oh, I always look to look at, I always like to look at anything that's interesting anyway, just, uh, we, we can dream, can't we? So yes, please, if people will feed us through information, uh, I'm always very pleased to do it, but we've pretty much got the five year plan and, uh, you know, that'll probably take 10 if you know what I mean. <laughs> I've got some specific questions here, and I know Tony will come in shortly with some more that are coming up on the chat, which I can see. Do you have any plans to produce any more NER kits in the future, the Northeastern Railway kits in the future? That's from Malcolm Young. Right, Malcolm. Uh, <laughs> not, not on the five-year plan, not Northeastern at the moment on the five-year plan. Uh, do, do, uh, but, but what I'm half guessing but, but it's a sort of question along the lines of when am I going to do a J21 possibly J25 possibly J27 or I'm hoping that might be this sort of uh, uh, and that lot many years ago when I first 
sort of started or first started doing it. Uh, I, I produced the J15 kit and I had hoped to follow up at some time with a J21 for no other reason but I want one myself. I'd, I'd, I'd sort of like one before I finish uh, for myself uh, and that lot. Uh, and, and I did commission uh, a, a lovely fellow, a lovely mo uh, pattern maker, Owen Lancaster, uh, to do as a set of J21 uh, masters uh, for, for the castings. Uh, now, the thing was, Owen was so good that everybody wanted him to do stuff. And I obviously didn't put enough pressure on him because, you know, no money changed hands or anything. Uh, but the set of J21 patterns never did turn up. But you know what? If a set of J21 patterns ever turned up, well, that would be a nice one to put on the next five-year plan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Following your excellent kit from the Southern Region O2 Loco, do you have any plans to introduce some much needed kits for the Isle of Wight steam stock coaches to go with the Isle of Wight version of the O2? That's a question from Peter Storey. Right, Peter. Well, I, I, I'm going to say, sadly, it's not on the five year plan. Uh, I pretty much hoped that suitable rolling stock was available via sort of Dave Amersley, Roxy Mouldings, uh, you know, who's got a good reputation, you know, good man, good reputation, nice range of stuff. Uh, certainly is probably the man for a number of uh, coaches for the mainland uh, running of O2s. The Isle of Wight, a few people have said to me, well, what, what about uh, uh, that lot? You can probably see, although I, I do this, you know, the Southern Queen Mary break van, uh, I did make the bogey, which is a standard coach bogey, and I did separate that out uh, on the tooling and make sure that could always be a bogey for some coach kits with that half in mind. Uh, some of the people that have mentioned either white stock, and whether I'm correct or not in saying this, uh, have sort of pointed out that an amount of the either white stock was rebogied on standard southern bogies. Hello, Jim, you're part way there. Uh, but as I say, not not on the five year plan. Uh, but they did have some wonderful rolling stock, didn't they, on the Isle of Wight? Uh, and I I do keep looking at those those uh, coach bogies from the Queen Mary, thinking you know what, it'd be nice to find some other things to put on the top of it. Bearing in mind what I said about my first kit being the Great Western McCorby, and it only happened because I had the right bogey. Well, uh, yeah, you know, if you've got a bogey, it, it, it's surprising where it can lead you to. But yeah, as I say, uh, not on the five year plan. Um, again, similar lines, but I guess this, this brings it all together. Dudley Hubbard was saying that. Um, your kit selection is quite eclectic and quite a few LNERs, loco stock, smatterings of BR, Great Western, one Southern loco, one industrial diesel. Is there any rhythm or reason as to how you came to develop that selection and how is it going to pan out in the future? Will you get your customers to influence the five-year plan or how has that come about your five-year plan? What's, what's feeding the... Uh, the ideas right right well the five-year plan I, I, I mean we've been saying with that you know all the five-year plan has been the excuse for 15 years or so now for you know well i'd like to do it and i'll get around to it someday uh so it, it it's not it's not hard and fast but it, it it's a way of perhaps thinking of the next three or four sensible projects uh and doing a little bit on them here and there uh right why, why so many LNER kits? Uh, right, when I first started producing kits, the LNER was very much the neglected railway. Uh, if you look end of the 80s, mid 1990s, Great Western was covered very well. Great Western's always been covered very well. The Southern was very well covered uh, as well because you, you you got the kits from Vulcan covering some items. Uh, you got DJB covering Southern. Uh, you'd got 
Shedmaster kits, uh, which again, a lot of Southern uh, in the range. Uh, I've got a bit of a feeling you've got game nail kits with a bit of Southern. So you sort of looked at the Southern and you thought, well, that's well covered. The Great West was well covered. The Sun was well covered. The LMS was well covered. At the time, the LNER was, you know, a bit of a neglected one. So there was a natural gap in the market there anyway. Uh, and certainly things like the Y7, which was my first kit, uh, it sold for under £50, found a ready market uh, in that. Uh, now, I've been very aware that selling somebody a Y7 or a small steam loco, tank loco as a starter kit was serving me ever so well 30 years ago and sort of is serving me well now. But people's modelling period is moving forward, particularly with the introduction of a lot of the ready-to-run, uh, the diesels that are available. There's a lot of people looking at green and blue diesel period uh, and that lot and sort of saying, oh, I'm looking to model 1970s, 1980s. So I'm very aware I can do with moving forward in the time frame my offering, uh, probably by 30 years, where I could sort of put Y7 on the on the table and say, well, they were still running on the North Sunderland Railway on passenger trains in 1950. People are now wanted saying, well, I want to model, you know, uh, my local industrial branch in the 1980s or something. Uh, so yeah, that that will sort of shape where I'm going. Uh, and yeah, we need more for the diesel modeler. I've got a lot of um, questions coming in oh, so about awesome. Great Western <laughs> as well. So I'm you may awesome. think it's well covered, but there is um, the fact that you're an inspiration. This was from Nicholas Bennett saying you're an inspiration and please do a Great Western Railway loco kit, which I can build, unlike some which are impossible. Um, and there's another person here who says that they are dreaming of a manor, please. So Great Western Manor, that's again Nicholas Bennett saying that he would like a Great Western Manor. Uh, and in fact, there's also Robin has asked for a Great Western local kit as well. <laughs> well, I, 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 I must admit, I was perhaps thinking along the lines of uh, one of those sort of little Cambrian 240 tanks or something like that could sort of uh, uh, excite me. I, uh, I'm going to have to watch this here as we get eight mail. I, <laughs> I, I love travelling behind the manors on the Seven Valley, but I, I don't think one could quite excite me as much to produce a kit for one as, say, something like an LNR D49. But, you know, but that's being honest. <laughs> And, uh, and I think that is very honest because it has to be something that you quite feel passionate about as well, doesn't it? If you're going to go into actually manufacturing and, and actually copying out, have you seen the amount of rivets on a, on a manor, particularly that tender? <laughs> the <first> curves. <laughs> Um, Tony, I'll hand over to you for a minute so people get a change of voice because I can see that there's lots and lots of questions coming in on the chat now. So over to you for a few, please. OK, then. Well, uh, earlier on, Bob Lawrence asked the question, have you got any new items in the pipeline? Are you going to give any big reveals tonight? Oh, uh, uh, right. Uh, well, I, I, I'm not sure I'd sort of can't count it uh, as a big reveal, but uh, what we were showing uh, to, to illustrate the etching uh, process of a full sheet, and, and this is a standard etcher sheet, which is, I'm going to say 12 by 18, uh, although really it's 450 millimetres by 300 millimetres, but, you know, we're still English, thank you very much, uh, and that lot. Uh, and this is sort of what we tend to work on. Uh, this is actually the body uh, for my latest kit, which in the video from Northampton, I talked about putting in uh, an artwork to the etchers, hoping that they, one, they could clean the copy camera because they reckon they hadn't used it for a year, and also that their film in the box was still good. Well, I'm pleased to report their film, that they cleaned the camera excellent, and the film will still be top notch because it, again, it's a piece of uh, camera work and a piece of etching work that uh, 
when I picked it up uh, just over a week ago, I mean, I've got a tear in my eye at the quality. Uh, and this is a body. There's going to be uh, a nickel silver chassis to go with it. So this is 80 percent of the kit and then the chassis will make up another 20 percent i mean i'm saying that basically this is a full sheet of brass for the body and then the chassis will go on the same size sheet but in nickel but the chassis will actually get repeated four times so uh and that lot and this is actually the 204 horsepower 060 drury uh shunter uh mainly the industrial one version uh or maybe maybe the ones that were supplied to the industry uh although there was also i'm going to say 14 was the first breweries that british railways had and became their class 04 although they're different from the main production run uh which has been produced by vulcan you know the vulcan kit uh ready to run in brass by Backman. I, I kept away from the uh, uh, sort of full production batch because I wanted to cover the industrial one and the ones that basically, the ones that went on the Whiz Beach and Upwell. Uh, and funny enough, with the, North, uh, the Northampton video presentation, I you showed an, an image of one of my very early layouts and basically on there was my second scratch built logo, which was a Whiz Beach and Upwell Drury 06004. So basically, I'm, I'm, produ I'm producing a model that I sort of scratch built 35 years ago as a young Callow youth. So in, in, in some ways, it's going to be interesting to see if I can do a little bit better. <laughs> but yeah, so... This is it. We've got the test. Uh, we've got the test etch. Uh, I've yet to do it. I've yet to do anything with it. Uh, you know, each day I think, oh, I'll just sort of have an hour or two on it. And then by the time I sort of dealt with uh, the phone calls and uh, the administration, I think, oh, no, hang on a minute. I don't think the brain's in any gear now. I'll just go and do a bit of casting or do a bit of packing. But, uh, but yeah, uh, next job's to actually uh, start uh, proving it. Now, I'll put in the bit of caution, the 040 Drury took us five years from this stage to it being out as a kit. Now, I'm hoping this is going to be a lot quicker, but I don't think it's going to be six months. <laughs> so, so that's it. Yeah, yeah. A, a Drury 060 uh, made a lot of sense to follow it through having done the 040. I thought, if I don't do another diesel shunter, I'll have forgot how to do everything by the time we get round to it. So, yeah, you know, hopefully logic. And again, should appeal to, well, it should appeal to a modelling period from 1952 up to the present day, really. Yeah. So we, we move in the period forward. Mm -hmm. um, there's been quite a few questions both before the start of the, you know, for, as a result of your video, and as a result of this, uh, talking about your uh, catalogue of, of locos that you've already produced that don't currently appear in your latest catalogue, such as the worst low class, uh, the uh, London and Southwestern Region 02 and G6. Is, is it been a deliberate? But oh, yes, yes, very much. They, uh, you, you, you mean you mean the like, the kits that are being rested? I think I think that's the term they uh, they use. They are resting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, but ba basically, my, my range uh, there's give or take a, a, a kit or an item. There's seventy five separate sort of kits uh, or uh, and that lot in it. That I find is about all I can juggle as. You know, as individual items, you know, as individual items, as products to, to correlate and bring together, uh, that's all I can manage. So for a number of years, and if you look back, uh, I did Great Eastern Tanks. There was a J67, a J69. I did an N7. You know, locos have been being dropped out of the range probably for about the last twenty years. Uh, it's got to the point where. When something new comes along, which was the 040 uh, Drury Diesel Shunter, 
the J50 went out the range to make you know to, to make space for it, it provided its space. Uh, now the main determining factor, you know, so is the actual casting molds. Uh, with the casting molds, as you probably picked up from Andy Duncan's uh, presentation and that lot, they're, they're, they're a vulcanized mold, they're made from an organic rubber. They are life dependent, the same as uh, the tires on your car is life dependent. So, you know, all these fellas that have got these classic cars that perhaps only do 500 miles, 1,000 miles a year, but even though they've already worn the tires, after 10 or 12 years, they've gone hard and they need to retire them. And it's the same with, with, with the casting moulds. One, they deteriorate with the use uh, and the eat on them. But even if it's a mould that's not getting a lot of use, after about 10, after about 10 years, they go on and then all the castings start flashing. And, you know, but... I, you know, I like to keep the quality of what I'm doing up. So I, I tend to, as a benchmark, think to myself, when I sort of go to pack the castings, I tend to think, well, would I be happy to have it? Or could I use it? And I tend to think, well, yeah, if I could use it, that would go in. If I, if I wouldn't be happy to have it in that condition, how can I present it? So there's a lot of fettling, you know, you'll, you'll file off flash, you'll scrape back with a knife and that lot. Well, after about 10 years, you suddenly think, cool, this is taking, you know, this is taking a lot of getting a decent set of castings in a bag off that mould now, whereas, you know, for a brand new mould, you sort of get, get them and you think, oh, a little bit flash, and off it comes with the thumbnail and a little roll and lovely, and, you know, then it becomes, you know, a knife blade, and then it almost becomes a screwdriver blade to chisel out, you know, some holes, and then the file, and then you sort of do a casting, and you think, oh, what's that bit of black rubber that's in that's sort of in the corner of that casting? And you look at your mould and you think, well, that's a bit of a mould that it's talking about one. So, and pretty much, uh, so, so you'll perhaps push it for another two or three years thinking you really ought to get your finger out and repair the moulds. And then there's a point that oh, you're thinking it's getting hard work. And normally when it's time for a loco, for a kit to drop out the range, there's, you know, there's no doubt which one you're going to get rid of. You sort of think to yourself, well, I'll get rid of the J50, uh, you know, and that lot, life's a lot easier working with a new kit and new moulds. Now, the photo tools are still there. Uh, the J50, it was an early kit. It wasn't as sophisticated as what I do now. Uh, there wasn't cab detail because the early kits were tended to be done down to a price uh, and when you hit the price that you was going to sell it at, if you used up the amount of materials you was going to use to reach that price then you something had, had to be missed out and missing out cab de interior uh, back in them days nobody minded if it was oh that's only going to cost me 50 quid but it's got no cab interior people was happy to spend 50 quid if you said, well, it's 75 quid with cab interior, they'd perhaps keep the money in the pocket. But, but that sort of changed. So, but yeah, the J50, set of etchings, I think, still still sound. Uh, maybe someday it will come back into the range. Some, some items have. For instance, three or four years ago, I, I produced look, what I think is a lovely 242 tank, the F7. Uh, that had been out the range. That went out the range probably about 12 years ago. I revamped it and brought it back into the range, I'm going to say three, four years ago. To be honest, that F7 now uh, is as good an offering as I'd like to give. I think it will stand next to pretty much most on the market. Uh, and that lot. So, yeah, there's no reason why they shouldn't come back. So I'm going to use the word resting rather than gone, gone forever. So what might fall out of the range next? Uh, I was thinking somebody would say, now, 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 <laughs> There's a terrible temptation to sort of uh, mention something. I've got, I've got a load of, you know, I've, I've got a load on the shelf, and you know, they'll gallop off like, uh, <laughs> not, uh, which is probably a bit unfair. And you, you could shoot yourself in the foot. Right. What's what's likely to uh, to fall off the range? Uh, possibly something Scottish. I've got the Scottish locos, uh, which I. Didn't develop as kits myself. My good friend George Dawson developed them, and I was so pleased to buy them off him. Uh, 
Now, within that range, that was a range of six Scottish locos, uh, and there was 30610 locos in that range. There's the J36, which is ever popular. Everybody loves a J36. Everybody loves board. So that, you know, sort of sells a bit. Then George did two of the big uh, Scottish 060s, the J35 and the J37, every for eight plodders uh, and that lot. And for a few years now, I found that it wasn't, it, it wasn't worth having, to, having a, an option of two big 060s in the range. In fact, it was almost defeating itself. People were coming along and going, oh, I fancy a J35. Do I fancy a J37? And you see them hovering on the stand. And we know that Scotsmen, you know, like to weigh up and, you know, are prudent with their money, so they don't. <laughs> and they then say, oh, I'll go away and think of which one I want. And they never buy any. <laughs> For a number of years, I produced a pack. I dropped the 37 out of the range and packed up a batch. And a batch uh, is eight for me. You know, produce, producing loco kits when they're normally in production, normally I'll pack six to eight of a batch. So any more than that gets hard work, any less than that gets hard work. So uh, uh, it, it depends on the distribution of the etchings, uh, the parts. But the Scottish O's and O's are producing eights. So I produced a batch of eight J35s and dropped the 37s out of the range. And that focused a lot of attention, and the 35s sold nicely. So I've now dropped the 35 out of the range, and I've got eight, well, I packed up eight th J37s. And there's a bit of interest in that. But maybe after they go, once the J37s sort of sell, will the 35 come back? Or, or will both of them go, you know, so, so that's a candidate for going next. Yeah. You know. I've, I've, one of the gentlemen uh, has asked, have you got, ever thought of producing any continental models? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I, I, mean, I mean, we're talking thoughts, right? Uh, you know, we, we can have thoughts, we can have pipe dreams, we, we, we can lose, lose sight of realism and that lot. Right. One of, one of my joys uh, over probably the last 20 years or a little bit more now uh, was being taken to former East Germany uh, by basically a bunch of uh, uh, full-size train drivers. Uh, but, but they was all working, well, they was all working for EWS at the time uh, and that lot. But... Uh, they sort of tended to go on the continent uh, with their privileged travel and all that lot. Of oh, you, you've got to visit the German Narragage. You really have got to vi vis visit it. You know, fantastic. Well, we'll take you to the Arts Mountains, Jim. You know, and uh, uh, I mean, they took me completely unsuspecting uh, and took me to Wernigge Roder and the art system. And they've got their big 210 two tanks and their 262 tank uh, uh, and that lot, as well as their ballets. And Every station's got a bar, and every and the trains have got uh, open wagons on the back that you sort of travel, you know, through this mountain scenery with bottles of beer, and you you have a few and that lot. And, and once you've had a few, you stand at the terminus and you look at these continental locos and that lot, and you and you go, oh, oh. I'd love to model this. I'd love to produce this. How fancy and that lot. And when you've had a few beers, <laughs> <laughs> and then the next morning you've sobered up. <laughs> All of those exterior fittings. And you look at on those continental tank locos. And they've got four different domes going down them, all, all, all with valves on and sandboxes and that lot. And you sit there and you think, Struth, how the hell would anybody produce a continental model of that? And what would you have to pay the pattern maker? Never mind, <laughs> you have to produce them. So uh, that's the answer. Uh, I've thought about it. <laughs> so the answer is probably not. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what about open wagons? Have you ever thought of building them? on the back balcony of a German narrow gauge loco and put beer down me, I'd probably promise to do anything. <laughs> <laughs>
it must not necessarily be a narrow gauge. It could have been a, a standard gauge uh, freight car, for instance. Ah, now. Uh, you, uh, yes, yes. I probably wouldn't need that much beer to actually start looking with seriousness, but that, that uh, could be a possibility. Uh, I, I would not like to rule that out. Uh, and, uh, but no, not on the five year plan is probably what we could say, but, uh, but yes, some of the freight stock, uh, to, to, to be honest, some of the diesels are quite universal as well. Some of the diesels uh, that was used on the continent, uh, you know, uh, was also used, would have a market in Britain, would also have a market uh, uh, in Australia uh, and that lot. Uh, uh, you, would you would face a lot of uh, competition by German producers. Yeah, ah, right. Yeah. So I think it's better to focus on freight cars because uh, the, vari the variety is uh, more, more broader uh, spread. They, they, they would be probably a good opportunity to go and do research. I mean, I, mean I'm, I, I, I know I know very little about German beer and that is a subject I would like to do a lot. Oh, oh German, German beer, that one. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it, it is quite a cool picture. I can't make out what it is. You, uh, that, that, that's not a dunkel beer, is it? It's a, it's a stout beer, a dunkel, a dark. Ah, oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because because I uh, love the Guinness. Uh, that's my favorite beer. Right. Right. Yes. <laughs> uh, out on uh, the Saxony, Czech Republic, Polish Republic border, uh, there's a place called Zittau that's got uh, a 750 yeah. millimeter. Uh, yeah. Line, which, oh, I've got right. memories of. And they do a beautiful dunk or dunkel beer there, a, a sweet, I, I believe it's more of a pills beer rather than a vice beer. But yeah, yeah. Sweet. Uh, oh, <laughs> the days just go by, you know. Right? <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. <laughs> yeah, I think Germany has the same variety of beers as Great Britain has. <laughs> I, I can see the Probably. gentlemen are really enjoying talking about beer, but. <laughs> I think we'll stop here. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um, there was there was another question. Somebody asking about: Are you fancying producing any open wagons? Right, no, that's a, that's a funny one. Uh, originally, the idea of doing an open wagon as an etch kit, people look down their noses at. Now, so I'm I'm going back perhaps twenty five years. Uh, a mat lot, you know, and the sort of well, there's a lot of work in an etch wagon. Uh, why would you want to do that with an open wagon when you can build a very nice one from ABS uh, in white metal? You can build a plastic one from Barkside or Slater's, uh, you know, a mat lot. So the etching process, in some ways, lends itself nicely to steel vehicles by its nature. Uh, it also, because of the work involved, uh, lends itself, and people like the idea of the unusual wagon. So, all right, as an open wagon, I've got the 50 ton bogey brick wagon. Uh, you can't, you know, open wagons don't come more distinctive uh, than that, uh, and bigger than that. Uh, and there's a lot of work involved, but pretty much each brick, brick wagon replaced five little standard open wagons uh, and that lot. So, you know, there is what open wagons in the range for tube wagon and that lot, but they've tended to be the unusual ones because let's face it, most modelers like an unusual wagon. Increasingly, people have been saying to me, well, we'd enjoy the etch wagon building anyway. So, we'd enjoy building 
even if it's going to take them twice or three times, a, a, a fairly plain, more run-of-the-mill open wagon, simply because they like the brass and they like the durability of it. Uh, so, yes, yes, I have considered open wagons. Uh, as I say, the items I've got penciled in, I've not got an open wagon penciled in. Uh, uh, in the five-year plan, but I got half an eye on a number of my axle guards and buffers and that lot, and I've got an open wagon in mind. But basically, I've looked at I've looked at and I thought, well, hell, I've got all the castings I'm going to need because because you know a determining factor is getting the ma getting the masters done for the castings. I mean, you know, I, I can produce the etch I can produce the artwork for the etchings. That's in my hands. Uh, I haven't got the skill to produce a full spring and axle box of that lot. That's a that's a job for a specialist pattern maker or now the 3D printed uh, pattern makers or routes uh, and that lot. But but there's quite a few there's quite a few open wagons that sort of I stir around the masters I got from my other range and think to myself, well, all, all I need is a sort of simple end stanchion as a master or a couple of extra bits, which are within my pattern making capabilities. So, yeah, increasingly people are asking me about it. Uh, and there's probably a market for it where, you know, if you said to somebody, I've got a five plank open wagon and it's at the price of an etched brass kit, the term I know was sort of 20 years ago, maybe they rub their hands together now. You mentioned modern technology there with 3D printing. Yes, yes. Uh, well, 3D printing and laser cutting, uh, does that, how will that affect your futures? Do you, have you any thoughts on that? Right, Three, 3D printing uh, was the last piece of the jigsaw that, that came together. Again, from the video from Northampton towards the end, Jackie was saying, am I satisfied? with the product and very much I am very satisfied with what I'm able to offer people now it's pretty much everything I've ever wanted to achieve on there on the standard uh, the last part of the uh, of it was 3D printing uh, of masters now a chimney a dome that sort of thing a good pattern maker on the lathe is always going to be able to produce an item like that far cheaper, far quicker than 3D printing. But if you imagine uh, a spring, an axle box and a back, back in, there's a lot of work in that. Or a bogey, for instance, I've got a, ra I've got a range of bogey kits, freight wagon bogey kits, in, in, uh, which I brought out a couple of years ago. The masters of them are all 3D printed. And it was a case of I needed a bogey for the Great Northern Brick Wagon and produced that. Lovely fella, Yarrick Canis, did us all the design work. And we actually had the 3D brasses as masters produced by, well, those Slate has produced for us. Uh, and they was phenomenal quality, uh, but, you know, at quite a price. From David White at Slater's, as he said, now as David would perhaps say, Well, dear boy, if you want the best, you must pay for it. And you can't argue with David on that. Uh, and that lot. But yeah, that was it. But once we produced the Great Northern Bogey using 3D printing, Yarrick said, Well, why don't you produce a load of other side frames to use to just fit in and use the same set of parts for the brake gear and the bolster and the swivel? And it made so much sense to go on and produce another five different bogies that could influence future kits. But they also sit quite nicely as a product in their own right. And they were all done by 3D printing. And we actually went to Shapeways for those, uh, which, if I've got it right, is uh, a sort of 3D printing bureau based in the Netherlands. But literally, all that happens is Yarrick sent the file up to them. And as if by magic, two weeks later, you open a little parcel came, you open this bag, took it out of a little uh, sort of satin black bag, and there was uh, basically a brass that brought tears to your eyes, the quality of it, 
And literally, you had to do, all you had to do was cut the sprues off, and that dropped straight in the mould uh, as a master. Well, the beauty, uh, uh, and this is where it comes in, if you imagine a set of bogeys, so you hope, you know, shape ways don't send one bogey to you, side frame to you, they send four side frames to you, and two centres and everything, because that's the beauty of 3D printing. So you can make in the mould the multiples of everything you want, and every one is first generation master quality. So yeah, you know, for, for items, for intricate items, uh, and that lot bogey side frames, uh, fit-ins and that lot, yeah, the 3D printing uh, really came in as a, the last bit of the jigsaw. Also, uh, I really love this. We've got Model U that do the figure scan. You, you, you know, he's been at uh, Gildex for a good few years and he's, yep. he's got his stand there and he's got all his props, you know, his, his, his dress up and his, you know, and that one. You can go around there and you put the engine driver's hat on, uh, uh, jacket on and you put the hat on and that lot and you sort of stand there with a the shovel and, you know, you can work the height out for the cab side of your latest kit uh, and put your arm there or for your dreary diesel shunter. You can sit yourself forward and you can get the perfect dreary diesel shunter stance by taking your sort of cut down broom angle on that you sit there and he scans you all up. And he'll send that file to Shapeways as well. And as if by magic, two weeks later, you tip it out and there's yourself. In brass, and I look at this. That's all I can put figures. I can put drivers and firemen and crew in my kits, but uh, which I have done for a number of years. But the originally started out uh, as I'd commission some hand sculptured ones. But now, each new kit I do, I have a driver and fireman specifically set up for that kit. Uh, and that lot. And normally one of them's me. <laughs> and, I think, and I think to myself, I'm going to live forever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to live in my kits forever now. <laughs> you know, that lot. So, yeah, that's the other side of the modern technology. Uh, yeah, you know, the fact that you, 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 you can introduce, you know, a figure. Now, all, all right, you, you might say it's, you know, you know, me sort of getting a bit big-headed wanting myself in every of the kits. Uh, but it does mean that you can actually set up the figure to suit that kit uh, and that lot. Uh, and I'm tending to take a friend or two along as well, you know. And normally, because ba basically, I started including the figures and then customers started moaning and saying, they're both huge, yeah? Oh, we got two figures, they're both the same height. So I'm now sort of trying to find a friend and thinking, oh, <laughs> John, Gar John Gardner from uh, from Bundy, we'll, we'll have to get him, you see, and have a, you know, he, he's a little a little bit shorter than me, if you know what I mean. About that. We'll give a bit of a, you know, so hopefully the driver can be a big fella and the, the fireman can be a, a, a little bit smaller. <laughs> That sounds a very good idea. Well, well, moving, back, moving, <laughs> moving back to uh, what you were talking about earlier and your etches and that, how long does it actually take from you getting a, the inspiration to produce a kit to getting it out on the market? Right. Or is everyone different? Everyone's different. Everyone's different because uh, it depends on what else is going on. And normally, you're probably sort of juggling two or three at the same time uh, because I've spoken about pattern making. Uh, I mean, I mean, I'm not a bad model maker. I can fabricate. I'm not a proper pattern maker. Not to produce the part that is durable enough because that Andy demonstrated what happens to the patterns uh, and that. Well, you know, it's one thing to produce a part. It's another thing to produce a pattern that's durable enough to be put in that vulcanising press, jacked up to its 10 tonnes and sort of cooked for an hour, if you know what I mean. Uh, so that one. So what tends to happen is you, you, you'll perhaps develop a kit, produce the artwork, get the test etchings, build the test etch, and you think, right, I can correct the actual etching side of it there. But 
net, once I've got my first one, I can pass that model onto a pattern maker in the hope that he'll make the cat patterns for the castings. If he's got the model they're meant to fit on, hopefully he'll produce you a smoke box door that actually fits on the smoke box. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, even, <laughs> even with giving the pattern maker the, the item it's going to go on, it's amazing how you get a part and you think, well, you know, why doesn't that happen? I know some people will get the commission of patterns before they've even put the model together. So what their castings fit like, I don't know uh, about that long. But the pattern making can disappear and, you know, it might take a year, year and a half for it to come back. So really, while you're doing that, you perhaps start doing the artwork for another model. And then something else comes on along. And before you know it, you know, you're, you're juggling three items. So... The, the Drury Diesel Shunter, uh, I pasted up the artwork uh, in July 2015, and I didn't have them available uh, for, oh, this is where we're losing it, Kettering 2020. I'm thinking how long ago it was since we last had a Guild show. So... It took me from 2015 to packing up the artwork to I, I was about a week out of actually physically being able to say, here's a kit, sir. So that took five. So you can reckon about five years on that. Uh, but, but that is particularly long. Uh, and mind, mind you, if you look at the Queen Mary Bright van uh, and you look at the O2, they seem to take an awful long time to, blooming, uh, to produce as well. But but somewhere in that time, I did manage to produce two kids. So, uh, you know, uh, make, you know, oh, that, that, that's not that's not down development work. I'll tell, I'll tell, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When, when you do the etches, yeah. how many etches do you get done at once? Right. Uh, normally, when a kit first comes out. Uh, you sort of take a guess and think, well, you know, uh, you know, how popular is it going to be? How embarrassed do you want to be sort of 12 o'clock Saturday at Gildex, you know, by the, by the fella saying, yeah, I want one of them. So, so for, in, for instance, the O2, which I knew I would get sorted over the summer that it came out, in anticipation for Gildex, the O2, I packed 20. Uh, and they just about lasted me till Sunday morning on uh, uh, Gildex uh, up at Telford. So, you know, but, but, but 20 is a lot. Normally, I produce in sixes or eights, depending on what the distribution of the kit is. I mean, I mean for instance... This 04, which I was showing you uh, the uh, sort of test etch for, first test etch for, I was say, it's going to be one full sheet uh, of brass uh, and then a quarter of a sheet of nickel silver for the chassis. So what will happen is that chassis will get repeated four times on a standard 12 by 18 inch sheet of uh, etch sheet. So that will get produced in multiples of four, because obviously you might as well use up all your chassis. So, you know, that, that'll that be one that, you know, sort of eight at a time, which, which is a good number. Uh, you, know, you know, by the time you've sort of done the castings for eight sets, your moulds are getting hot and stuff's not flowing again so well. You know, you don't, you, know, you don't want a cold mould. You normally need to pre-warm your moulds or the first or second spin you chuck to one side to get the mould warm. But you don't want your moulds to get too hot either. So by the time you've done perhaps eight, perhaps if it's a mould that you're running twice, uh, you know, so it's a steam loco, you might only have masters for one sort of tank filler and two buffers and, and that sort of thing in that sort of mould. But if you run it twice you've produced all the items you want to off, if you know what I mean. So if you imagine you're doing eight, well, that's 16 spins, by which time I find, you know, the moulds are getting a bit hot, they're, you, you know, they've gone a bit soft, so you, 
you're clamping, but you're actually closing up your pore channels and you're getting shortages and that lot. And, and also, in some strange way, and I, I don't know what the logic of this is, I can get really enthusiastic on producing eight sets and packing up eight, you know, even just packing the nuts and bolts and the bits in, in the bags and that, you know, and you sort for, for eight. And then you get them in. If you start doing more than eight, you're thinking, oh, I can't wait till I've done this 12 and then I can get on to the next lot of different nuts and bolts and that lot that I'm putting in. You know, so I, I don't know what the logic is, but... You, I, th I think the logic is that we're all three-year-olds at heart and got a limited attention span. <laughs> I tell you what, Tony, I think you have put your finger absolutely on it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a gentleman asked, do you, when you're making these moulds, do you get much in the way of sh shrinkage in the cold cure silicon? No, I don't use cold cure silicon. There we are. That's the answer to that question sort of thing. Silicon. I did mention it at the Northampton. When I first started, so we're going back about 30 years ago, and I bought my first set of basic casting kit, which was produced by Alex Taranti, which was very much aimed uh, at the hobbyists or schools and, uh, uh, and that lot. Uh, that system worked with a cold cure uh, red silicon rubber, that what they call room temperature vulcanizing rubber that you uh, you add in an arden to and mixed up and you made your molds in two halves spread over three days and all that lot that was very very hit and miss on shrinking actually uh and that i first discovered the true extent of that uh when i started producing the white metal dumb buff and wailing kits which was some of my early items which were produced in these molds and I produced sort of the mould for, for one, and you know, for a five plank, shall we say, and then I produced another mould for a four plank and all that lot. But you know, you, you'd cast them and you'd have shortages or whatever. And when I first started, I started the underframes, the you know, the sole bar uh, uh, and that lot. I'd sort of chuck all in a box and then think, right, you know, well, they come from a five plank, but it's really four planks that I want to pack, pack up, you know, and I'll take it. And then I was getting a lot of complaints from customers. And they were saying, well, I've got a wagon kit here. And the left-hand sole bar is three millimetres shorter than the right-hand sole bar. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, 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 you know or, or one, you know. And you're thinking, well, what the hell could this be? Because, you know, when you first did it and in your mould, you perhaps had one side, one end, one sole bar, one set of brake gear, and you spun it twice. That was a full wagon's worth. But... Because that's it was two sole bars off the same mould, so to speak. They were the same. But as soon as you started using a sole bar off another mould, you was getting these complaints. And you're thinking, well, it's the same master I put in. But one set mould would be three millimetres. Yeah, you, know, you, you was getting the shrinkage over, well, oh, I don't know, what what would a, a, a sole bar of a dump buffered wagon be about... Uh, probably about 120 millimetres or something. You was probably getting three mil shrinkage on it. But you never knew. You'd make another mould and there were no shrinkage at all. So shrinkage is a very, very hit and miss. It does happen with the organic moulds, the, the vulcanised moulds as well. Uh, but normally that happens in something like an end stanchion to go on a van. And you sort of think to yourself, right, well, the end stanchion's 50 mil high to go on the van. Normally, what I'll do is make the end stanchion 51 mil or maybe 51 and a half mil and make some sort of allowance for it. And if you make an allowance for shrinkage, it won't shrink. <laughs> but if you don't make an allowance, it will. It will. <laughs> you might look on some of my van kits because normally, say, you know, as an example of a component, there's an end stanchion goes on a van. And I've normally got to locating lugs that just go through a couple of etched holes, you know, to give you something to locate and put a dab of solder on the back to just sort of do it. But you'll probably see that what I've got is one round hole and one oval hole, and that oval hole is to cope with the shrinkage. As per your uh, As per, video earlier on. Yeah, yeah, you know. Mind you, it did take me a few years to cotton on to that. <laughs> Uh, there was another another question about uh, 
what motivates you behind your level of detail that you put on your locos and such like? Uh, hmm. uh, right, I've, I've always tried my best, uh, you know, uh, and perhaps as I've produced kits, they've got more sophisticated, uh, you know, as a natural way of things. Uh, and I think what people ask for or expect has become more and more sophisticated. So, so, so there's been that. I've perhaps tried in trying to get more detail. So, so the, the early stuff, you know, what was produced first early locos, end of the eighties, uh, if it was a tank loco, well, you know, under the boiler, it was just, you know, the foot plate, you just continued on. It was flat edge, you know. Uh, then it crept in that people sort of said, well, it'd be nice to see a bit of the frames. And, you know, so you went to that. And then it was, well, it'd be nice to see a little bit of inside valve gear uh, and that lot. So, you know, and I think that was all very true. And it made a very, you know, they, certainly for layout models, they was moving things quite a bit forward. So perhaps, shall we say, when you get to the level where you're trying to put a little bit of inside valve gear in, if you look at my kits, i perhaps go for a number of components that would provide a silhouette. You know, you could look at it and think, well, let me know. I can do all the rocker bars and that, but out of 18 separate components. Or I can do a silhouette out of three laminates and the average man can drop that in and then get on with doing something else because, it, you know, he's got better things to do with his time. Uh, so it's nice to put a representation of the detail. How fiddly that, that detail, I don't know, but pretty much... And a number of my customers sort of subtly told me or left me in no doubt one or two. Uh, the Queen Mary Brakeman, uh, the Southern O2, pretty much the LNER J68. They didn't want to see any more detail than that. They were ever so happy with the level of detail they was getting. Some of it we could leave off if we didn't want it, but don't go beyond that. Uh, so, yeah, beyond what I've got with those, that, you know, you know then becomes the preserve, I mean, Finney and Smith, uh, not Finney, uh, Finney Seven, sorry, I'm thinking of Dave's brother, actually, uh, <laughs> uh, or oh, sorry, Dave, uh, and that lot, uh, but the Finney Seven range, uh, I mean, that's museum showcase, I, I mean, if, if you buy all the, all, all the, all the, uh, the elements of their kit, I mean, you've got something that's museum showcase. Well, you know, some people will probably say, well, right, I've got my A3. That's going to be my modeling for the next year. Uh, uh, and so that's a nice bit of a market for that person where perhaps my customer would like the loco and a couple of coaches in the same modeling period. So, you know, they're not going to want that showcase level. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether I'll, I think beyond this, I'm now waffling. I, it, it, no, not at all. No. That. <laughs> no, there was... but, but, but basically, there's a point where I look and think, what well, bloody hell's the point? In that? Yeah, yeah, when I look and think, cool, I don't want to be struggling with doing that. <laughs> That's the point to leave it off, I think I've learned. So it's what you like building then? Well, it's what I'm like, now, now the only trouble is, I'm losing it, you know. You know, I, I, I'm losing it as the fingers get thicker and the eyes are going and uh, and all that lot. Uh, and the last loco I was building, do you know what? I struggle putting the, the pipes even on the lubricators, you know. Uh, and and I tend to only go for a cast lubricator and a couple of fine copper pipes as uh, as the representation. And I found that. I'm, I'm mucked up about four castings and thought, I'm just going to shove the castings on and never mind the pipes. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but that's all right for me. I'll best make sure you've got the pipe unions there. So the customers, yeah, a lot of my customers are downside better modelers than me now. So yeah, it, the thing to do, I think, is to have that detail there for people to fit if they wish to. Uh, but if you leave it off, hopefully you've still got a nice model. Yeah. Have you ever thought of building a, a D49? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, for about 25 years. <laughs> Are you going to do one? Uh, because we've had four people on here who want one. No, oh, right. Fair enough. Well, 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 you can put me down for one as well when I do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. What do we do? Do we do an unto a shire? There we go. Maybe, maybe we can send in for that one. A shire or a hunt? Yes. A shire or a hunt? That, 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 that'll be a question uh, for that lot. So they're going to say both, aren't they? Right. I'd love a D49. I mean, <sighs> For me personally, the biggest stuff like the, the J, uh, look like uh, you know A3s and that lot, gorgeous, gorgeous and that lot. But I, I, I mean, I'm a little, I'm a little, I'm a little loco man, uh, and I've been a little loud man. But a four four zero, you can sort of fit in anywhere if you know what I mean. Uh, and that lot. Going back to what we were saying about three D printing, one one of the areas that I've kept very very clear of over the years is uh, outside valve gear, full full outside valve gear, because of getting the pattern making done, uh, and that was always or always seemed to me to be a right minefield going along to a pattern maker and saying, "Can you produce for me the slide bars for cross heads uh, and I'm up for this outside cylinder loco?" Uh, because the pattern makers. Uh, would go go away, and they produce these wonderful to scale, where we know for valve gear to work and on a model, you want a, a little bit of sensible beefing up, but not so it's obvious that it's gone cr crude. It's that little bit of reinforcing rather than crudeness, and they'd also produce it to scale, you, you know, absolute to size. You know, so the slide bar, uh, you, you you know, you know, your slide bars. And you'd have your cross head and you'd have your piston rod on it and your cylinder end. And that piston rod would be a perfect length to just, stay, as a master, to just stay in, you know, the piston end like uh, of that lot. And then you'd go along to the slot to the, I mean, I mean, as white metal casters, I think we do a very good rendition of that lot. The, Investment casters, the lost wax caster, particularly if you're using the, those from the jewellery industry, I think get a little bit cruder. But one thing they certainly do get is a lot of shrinkage. So you go along, you know, and for, you know, for those components, you want them in, say, cast nickel silver. So you go along to, to your nickel silver caster. Uh, and, and I've seen this. I seen this by watching what happened with Jim Harris when he was producing the oatmeal ranges stuff, and he come back with these, you know, set of uh, castings for his outside valve gear and that lot, and it had a shrinkage on it, and so it make it up and it'd look lovely, and the piston rod would fall out because the shrinkage, you know, you could never get over to a cast to a to a pattern maker. Allow a bit extra, put a bit on there. And like, but now with 3D printing, this is the beauty. You're talking to a man who's not a pattern maker. You're talking to a man who's used to working on a computer and his concept is of doing rapid prototyping. And the clue is in the word prototyping. So he's used to doing something and you have him a look at it and then say, well, can you add another three mil? I can see a potential pro problem there. So... A full outside valve gear loco, I'd be very confident commissioning the pattern make uh, the pattern making for that using modern 3D. Because if we haven't got it right, they're, they're able to tweak it to get it right. Because to my mind, the more complicated you get, and as soon as you go outside cylinder, you go to a different level of sophistication and complexity. But that's great if the bits fit and work. If the bits don't fit, you know, that's worse. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. And if they don't work, and you've got to try and make it work, yeah. it's almost like scratch building, isn't it? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, have we had anything in yet, whether it's a, it's a hunt or a shire? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've had lots of lots of going on the lots next one. Lots for both. <laughs> yeah. um, somebody's mentioned that they've recently built one of your uh, l and &ER 10 ton perishable vans. Right, yes. But they've managed to acquire it 
some time ago, obviously, and it had an address in Leicester. Oh, yes. How was that? Oh, well, that's where I grew up. I, yeah. I, I, I was born in Coventry. I, I, I was a Coventry lad. Uh, and I, I only slipped that in because one of the other kit manufacturers, well, in fact, there were a few kit manufacturers that were born as Con Co was Coventry lads, uh, of which, if I'm I believe I'm right in saying that old Pete Water Waterman was a Coventry lad as well, like, uh, and that lot. So, yeah, I was born in Coventry, uh, but grew up in Leicestershire, a village of Sinaway in Leicestershire, you know, uh, and that lot. Uh, and when I first started, uh, I was working out of my mum's garage uh, in Sinaway. So, phew, struth, I'm trying to think when I left. If I said about 93, I think I left Sinaway at 93. And then I had a little period uh, in Colville in the Springboard Centre in Colville, which was the first industrial unit, uh, before sort of moving down to the Black Country. Well, time's moving on, uh, and I'm sure ah. Jackie's got some more questions. Right, yes. So, uh, and I'm sure you've heard enough of me for now, so I'll pass you back to Jackie. Thank you very much for talking to me, Jim. Oh, well, thank, thank you very much, Tony, actually. Uh, I, I must admit, I've been very, very much enjoying being given the questions. Uh, <laughs> I hope it's working your end because you know it certainly seems I'm, to be. I'm enjoying being late, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, I'm going to do a few quick fire now because oh. we're nearly nine thirty, and I've got quite a long list here now coming in. So, um, you mentioned gauge one and gauge O. Are there any other scales that you provide kits for? Right, I've done in the past. I've only got O-gauge kits now. Uh, right, one of the first things I did, uh, the N-gauge Society uh, produced some etch kits. They, they produced some etch kits, and we did a couple of LMS brake vans. One was a Stanier brake van. The other was, uh, I'm going to say, a 1657 or, or what one of the earlier ones. Uh, yeah, basically, I produced the artwork and provided the etchings, uh, for those, because uh, the village next to us, I, I grew up in Sonny, the uh, village next to me was Barrow on Saw, of which uh, an absolute fantastic bloke, Andy Calvert, uh, uh, as an engaged model, was there. And he was involved with the Engage Society and they're sort of starting a number of their first products. So, yeah, I produced in Engage, couldn't build them now, it's true, I struggled to build them uh, before. A lot of my kits were produced in three mil. Uh, by Finian Smith, uh, and that was a nice arrangement where they borrowed, uh, or they used the etching tools and shut them down to three mil. I've got, I have actually got all, when they stopped trading, they returned to me all the etching tools, uh, which means I've still got the intellectual property. There's no problem with them disappearing. So that, that was an arrangement that worked well in three mil. Uh, I had a nice range of four mil kits, uh, which was from, which I sold myself. Uh, and I haven't produced the four mil kits since about 2006, simply because I found that the seven mil kits was all that I could, could do. But every now and again, uh, perhaps in odd times or whatever, I do produce or I have produced a batch of some of the four mil locos. Probably the last time I did it was probably three or four years ago. Uh, but they've provided a nice little bit of jam on top of the bread and butter. Uh, a little bit of S scale for the S scale society, and then Big John Taylor has got uh, got a few uh, of, of my kits in S scale. Lovely scale for working S scale. Obviously O gauge, and then uh, an amount of my stuff has been done in gauge one as well. Excellent. So, a man of many talents, I think. Well, that's the beauty of the etching. That's the beauty of photo etching. It, it, you know, it, it it literally can be enlarged and reduced like any photograph. Excellent. Um, question from Michael Holland. At a time when scratch builders are using nickel silver for their locomotive superstructures, because it's easier to solder, easier to prepare for painting and better at holding paint, most kit manufacturers are still using brass for the purpose. Now, is that something that the cost penalty of using nickel silver instead of brass is sufficient because it's uneconomic? Or are there other reasons for continuing to use brass? Right. Uh, 
he says a lot of scratch builders use nickel. Uh, it's quite a soft nickel that the scratch builders use, as opposed to the nickel that the etchers use, which is quite an half hard ne uh, nickel, uh, a very rigid uh, nickel. Now, on my kits, particularly the bigger ones, uh, you know, when we get on to uh, you know, the, the tender locos uh, and sort of bigger tanks onwards, you'll find they're a mixture of uh, brass uh, for part for where I want the parts to be workable uh, and that lot, and then nickel silver. Now, I normally go for a thicker nickel silver, uh, so most of my kits are 15 found brass, say a logo kit, 15 found brass where I want the workability uh, for the body mainly the body components, but where I want workability, where I want either a thicker component or a more rigid component, I'll go for nickel silver. Uh, so and that's perhaps be the chassis. And that diesel we was talking about, sort of the bulk of the body, the bulk of the components are going to be in brass. There's going to be a quarter of a sheet of nickel. Uh, same thickness, actually, with, uh, with, with that is going to be 15 pound nickel. But what I want is that rigidity for the... Uh, the side frames, the rods, uh, and that lot. So that, that's the reason for doing it, but it is quite an odd nickel. I, over the years, I've built other people's kits where they nickel, and I find it hard work on anything that needs shaping and forming. So pretty much in nickel, I'd find it, I'd struggle to form, say, a diesel bonnet top. Where in brass, I find it very workable. Same for reverse curves of the, uh, you know, round, round the smoke box, tender flares, and that lot. So, from a workability point of view, I don't like nickel. And I've got a lot of friends that have sort of said, it's true, if I built, built that kit or he had his test etch in nickel, I don't want to build another one in nickel for that reason. So, there's that. Uh, knowing this question was coming, uh, I did preempt it and jot down. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a couple of prices. They, they are more expensive as well. Uh, that uh, diesel shunter sheet, which is in 15 foul brass, cost me £22.86 from the etcher. A 15 foul sheet of nickel silver cost me £29.40. So a bit of line in arithmetic, that's 29%. Nice how I did it so quick. Normally, when you're on thicker sheets, and uh, normally when I go for a, for a nickel for, for a chassis, it's 20 now, you're paying a little bit more because you've gone thicker. So the difference is, so it, it's roughly about a third uh, extra in cost for the nickel. Well, you know, it, that all puts a price on the kit. Uh, you know, uh, so yeah, it, it's going to be. But my... My main reason for, yeah, cost makes me think about where I want to use nickel and I use it sparingly. But for some operations, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's the thing. Uh, and that lot. So hopefully that. Right. Now, if I can very, very quickly, one of the things you picked up on was uh, easier to solder. Right, and over the years, a number of people have said, well, oh, why don't you produce some only nickel silver? You know, why? Oh, well, I find it a lot, lot easier to solder. And then you say, oh, that's strange. What solder are you using? What flux are you using? And we go, oh, oh, I don't know, just some more. I've had the roll of solder for years. And what flux? And we say, oh, well, you know, a uh, little bit of that sort of flux side paste and that lot or, or whatever. And then I'll say to them, ah, oh, well, if you switch to a good solder, such as what's available from, shall we say, a nice 145 solder available from Andy Duncan, Chris at Phoenix Models with, with the car's range, and if you switch to a nice flux, be it Andy Duncan's flux if you want, or if you want something a little bit more powerful, uh, the car's green label flux, you'll solder your nickel silver in your brass as easy as anything. And so it's surprising... You know, it's, uh, it's almost a fallacy of, oh dear, well, it's easier to use nickel. It's a lot easier to use the right soldering iron, solder and flux, I'll tell you. So, you know, there's that as well. Okay, I'm going to quickly canter through a few here. So quick 
you know, statement or question and then a quick answer. Um, you've actually answered Michael Bing's about the cost of a kit inadvertently with the last one. Um, John Hobden has let everybody know that there are several suitable Isle of Wight coach drawings in the Guild collection. Oh. So that's worth people knowing. Um, there's um, the D49, we've got Shire and the Hunt coming in. And then there was a mention, I've just got to find it again as I'm scrolling through these. Uh, the Morton um, Thompson D49 rebuild with inside cylinders. Yes, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got one from um, Jeffrey Godin that mentions that now that ready to run locos come with advice to as to the minimum advised radius, usually the Pico R2 40.5 inch 102 8 millimeter radius, could a similar advice message be included on literature and boxes of your loco kits? He realizes that larger loco prototypes may not be suitable to operate on the Pico R2, but smaller and medium sized locos should be able to. Right, yes, very much so. And he's really put his finger on what is what to me has been a major shift in O gauge and attracting new modelers to O gauge. Now, as people have said to me, Oh, well, we've you know, and rightly so, we've ready to run locos and, and stock available. Isn't that bringing in you know more new people? And it truly is at uh, that lot. What I'm finding with dealing with people is the availability of those Pico set track is bringing in new people. That's almost as important uh, a thing to go have a dabble with O-Gage uh, than the fact you can have a ready-to-run loco as well. And, that lot. and whereas, you know, when I designed the kits, you know, perhaps even five years ago, the standard thing was, we'll look around a six-foot radius curve, uh, Perhaps one in three people ask me on the stand now, will it go around a Pico set track curve? It's it's gonna it's gonna be a benchmark. It, it really is gonna have to be the benchmark. Like you say, it probably needs reflecting in the information I provide and that lot. Uh, I, I mean, there's been some wonder. There's been some wonderful things, and I've been absolutely sort of gobsmacked. But you know, we've, I've had customers turning up and saying, "Well, your six wheel coach is going around." The Pico said, well, I don't know. Oh, well, I've got three in and putting them on the stand and taking the coach down. And, that. and I'm thinking, well, I'll never go around there. And I've got smack, they'll go around. And there's a lovely bloke, uh, Steve Rowe, uh, has done the J15 build uh, on YouTube and that lot. And again, he said, when he first came to me, oh, I want the J15, I've got Pico curves. You'll know that, so you'll never build it to go around Pico curves. You'll have to do a lot of work and that. But Struthy sent me the video and he just plonks it on and it runs around as sweet as a nut. So, yeah, that is, that is going to be the benchmark for us. Uh, some, some stuff you do will, won't go around a Pico curve, but we've got to tell people that. Uh, but it's a hell of a selling point now if you can say to somebody, yeah, I can speak with confidence, it will go around. Mm. Um, quick question from Chris. Have you thought of doing signal box interiors such as lever frames and block instruments? Oh, that's, that, that's an Andy Duncan line, I would have thought. A man, <laughs> of, his, a man of his caliber ought to be doing that. And I mean, you could get somebody like Yarrick Canis to, uh, well, I'll say you somebody like Yarrick Canis to sort of uh, doing, the 3D, uh, do, doing the 3D designs and rapid prototype it. A Struve model you could go and actually uh, do a scan of them for Andy. That'd be a good tile. <laughs> Andy's probably thinking, no, please, I don't want any more work. <laughs> Um, more Northeastern Railway, please. There's a few people asking for that. Um, and then great thing with your models, Jim, is that it's easy to add as much details as we want. A good, accurate base is a great starting point. Thank you for your kits. That came from Tim Stubbs. Right. Um, and again, there's been a lot of compliments on here about thank you very, very much for, for your kits and the range that you do. Um, so I think, you know, there's there's so many compliments as well here. Um, somebody just quickly said, where in Coventry did you live? <laughs> Michael Bing's asking. 
Right, uh, Nightingale Lane, uh, Canley, uh, just down from Canley Gate Station. And I, I've, I've not actually gone back to the house that I was born in. Uh, I actually walked up Nightingale Lane, uh, I'm going to say about five years ago. Ne 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 never been there before, but I was sort of come off at Canley Station and uh, I was walking, funny enough, walking to the... Uh, the, the cemetery down there uh, from that lot, and I sort of went just walking down. And I thought, oh, I can get away, and that's familiar. I was there and wandered up, and I didn't actually go up far enough to actually get to where I was born. And I would like to go back and sort of thought, probably terrorize the current owners of this sort of new build that's there uh, and that lot uh, by sort of lurking and having a look round, but, uh, but yeah, I'd, I'd like to go back to, I'd, I'd like to visit where I was born, uh, okay. but that's where I came from, and, I, and basically, I've still got an uncle there, still got a little bit of family, still got an uncle there, uh, basically the McGowans were tie little kids. Uh, somebody said, uh, uh, it's Michael responding, I came from Tile Hill about a mile away, so there you go. Uh, no, I, I, I would tell, tell you, you, you ask around Tyler, I, I, I bet I bet they still remember Paddy McGowan. <laughs> I'll tell you what. <laughs> right, last <laughs> uh, But if you think it's Peter McGowan, there's probably still pubs that he's barred from. <laughs> <laughs> the last couple here, um, there's one about a, how about a bogey ballast hopper such as a sea cow? <laughs> The next five year plan, but not the current one. Okay. <laughs> um, and... I'll, 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 I'll chuck things in. That one to half, that one to half go. That one to half go nice with the uh, sharp brake van, the sharp ballast plow van that's on this year, this current five year plan. <laughs> and um, going back to continental models, how about some of the pre channel tunnel ferry vans? That's true, they'd be nice. Oh, they'd be very nice. Oh, that, and that would be it. And that would be a, a, an excellent reason to go. Drink. Well, ho hopefully the world will be such that we can go back drinking with the Dutch again. I was my <laughs> We've spoken of German beers, but only a few years ago. But I ended up on Dutch beer tasting, and I didn't realise they they all beer the Dutch old beer with a reverence as well. <laughs> okay. Two final questions. When you started out as a modeler, did you even imagine that you would progress to the level of activity that you're doing today? No, no. I, I mean, there was perhaps a pipe dream. There, 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 you know, there was also a pipe dream of, wouldn't it be nice to make your living? You, you know, even, even as a kid, uh, you know, perhaps from the age of... Up to about the age of 12, I wanted to be, you know, my dream job would have been a designer for Lego, you know, designing that lot. And then after that, I think it was my dream, you know, if you could make your living out of model railways, uh, you know, that was all this, you know, and I mean, you was being told not to be, so, yeah, don't be so daft, get a proper job. <laughs> oh, you're not going to do anything like that. Make sure you get a proper job first, you know. That lot. Uh, I, I think where I've ended up, the way it's supported me, uh, I'll, t I'll tell you, I'll, absolutely, the people I've met, the, friend, the friendliness in it uh, and that lot, uh, I don't think I could have guessed that it, you, you know, it, it was at that level and it was would be such a nice way of earning a living. You know, uh, it's, yeah, you know, I, I mean, what... Modelers are such straightforward people. I mean, f funny enough, the, uh, the credit card people that, uh, you know, do the merchant services, uh, sort of world pay, uh, was sort of on the phone and that lot, and he was asking, uh, you know, what can we do in different terminals and all that lot. And, you know, I said, oh, no, I'm happy with that, and I can also come on that lot. And, it, uh, and he started saying, well, yes, but where's your security? Oh, you do it that way, you won't get your authorization. And I says, you've been on dealing with modelers. And that lot, I, I, I've, I've never had a dishonest customer. You know, um, what a difference that must be than some of the people on the I Street retailing, you know, uh, and that lot. So, yeah. Good place to be. The final question. 
What further kits are in the pipeline? Are you allowed to tell us? I think we're just there, then, aren't we? It's... <laughs> <laughs> we keep getting a five-year plan. We just know we know about the next jury. I thought I'd reveal that. I thought I'd reveal that the the, dra- the draries on it. I mean, these are logic. The, right, uh, the five-year plan is the logic of it is they're all things that I've got work done towards anyway. The drury, that's that's there. Uh, we spoke of resting locos. Uh, I've now, the N7 dropped out of range many years ago. Uh, I've now got a new current, a new set of masters to cover where uh, castings are gone and the masters weren't capable of being vulcanized. So I've got now got a set of uh, masters that. You know, are as sophisticated as you can. Funny enough, I mean, the thing is, I've had the Masters for about four years uh, now, if you know what I mean. But, was kissing. but a logical next loco kit to introduce would be an N7, because a lot of people are asking, well, when are you going to bring it back? Mm-hmm. And I've got the elements for it, uh, towards it. Uh, an L and the RE4, uh, because we did an F3 kit, and when we did the F3 kit, and it was a logical way of doing it, we also designed uh, and proved the chassis. So I've got a two foot, I've got an E4 chassis. I've got the tender, if I get my finger out and separate it off as a separate kit in its own right off the artwork uh, of that, which is the next job waiting for me to do it. So it's only actually a body to develop on that. Uh, so that's logical for that to be on there. The five-year plan, you know, whether, whether it then ends up on the next five-year plan as that, and uh, a sharp break man for, for, for I've been collecting pieces towards, uh, and actually, with John Talbot sorted me out at the end because uh, I was saying, oh, I'm, I'm going to do a sharp break man, uh, but can't find any drawings, and he says, Lewis, and again, this is where modelers are wonderful. About a week later. A tube turns up and I took it down. And because these are still in service, or was then on the way, there's a full set of the, the drawings that are lodged with. Is it Serco that's actually the rolling stock uh, regulatory authority for network rail? But basically, it was a full set of current spec uh, drawings for a sharp break, man. And you think, well, there's no excuse now, is there? <laughs> and if you look at all those ballast plows and the uh, the operating gear and the winding down gear and that lot, next time you see one on the preserve line, you look at that and think, cool, wouldn't that be a lovely job for uh, 3D printing and produce the masters that way? You know, so another bit of an element come together. So there's a five-year plan. <laughs> Excellent. Well, you've made Martin Marriott's day because he was saying, will the N7 be reissued? So that's excellent that that is well, on that, the current. Well, well, that's the logical five-year plan. There's work done it. But, uh, but then, then, then again, there's jobs around the house that Megan's been waiting for for about eight years. But, you know, it's sort of... <laughs> <laughs> Jim, on, on behalf of everybody, I want to say thank you very, very much. I think we could have carried on for a long time, but I'm conscious that we we need to allow some people to get off to work if they've just got up in New Zealand and places and, and some people will be ready to retire for the evening. So I just need to show um, a quick slide to show people what happening next month. So please just bear with me there. Um, I need to go to find the slide come on no tea on the keyboard today sorry no <laughs> tea on the keyboard no the, you tell everybody in the world that i ruined a whole computer with a cup of tea is that showing on anybody's screen at the moment no not yet ah, there we are let me just bring that up to I have to bring it down there. Okay, everybody see that? Yep. Okay, so let's look at next month. Um, booking starts tomorrow. Well, it starts at midnight for anybody who's on that time oh, zone. It's a Dunhill. 
and it's Nick Dunhill talking about scratch building. So there's a video to watch of him building a boiler. Um, and then that's speeded up from our virtual show, but he will do a real-time build of a smoke box on the evening of the 26th of June. It's a Saturday night. Um, as we've mentioned, you'll get your joining instructions and the video details as soon as you register. And then there'll be a reminder that's sent out off, of, you know, about a week before and then on the day just to make sure people know exactly what they've got. Um, just make sure you don't forget that we've got the special interest group day on Saturday the 5th of June. That would have been the date of Doncaster. Um, but we don't want to do a full show because we're conscious a lot of people are making the most of time to meet with family and friends and have staycations. Um, it is a members only day, so there'll be a session on electronics, which is a joint um, session between Merg and the Guild with Ian MacDonald and Peter Reynolds between 10 and 11.30. We've got a session on CAD and 3D printing with Chris Walsh and James Aitken from 12.30 till 2. And then one on track building from 3 till 4.30 with John Bertie and Alan and James Aitken. If you look at the website under events and you're logged in as a member, you'll find just down here, Oh, we've just gone up a bit. Thank you. Um, special Interest Groups Day. And if you go on to that page, you'll find all the links you need. You don't have to pre-book. You just literally go on to the website. If you're logged in as a member, you'll see the Special Interest Groups Day. And you can actually find there all of the details you need. Just to click on the link and go into the Zoom whenever you want to. And if you want to do all three, you can. We hope those groups will be self-perpetuating. So once we've had the initial startup on the 5th of June, people will decide how often they want to meet, what topics they want to discuss, and then they will go forward with the Guild booking all the Zoom meetings. And if you want to look back at the, any of the videos of previous evening withs or find out more about the forthcoming ones, there's a page on evening with as well. And I'll just move forward on that one. Guildex, don't forget, we're still fingers crossed for the 4th and 5th of September. We're very much waiting to hear what happens with step four of the roadmap, but um, we'll keep you posted on that as soon as we know what's allowed after the 21st of June. And obviously we've mentioned the evening widths, which non-members have to pay for. We've mentioned the special interest group day, which obviously is members only. So, you know, there's never been a better time than now to join the Guild. Um, so for £28 in the UK, 33 for those overseas, um, you get all of your quarterly gazettes, the Guild news, all of the online shows free of charge, a reduced rate of entry uh, to our face-to-face -face events and a website full, absolutely full of information. So we look forward to seeing you again on the 26th of June. Um, I'd just like to reiterate again, Jim, thank you very, very much. Um, mm. I'm happy to stay online just a little bit longer if there's anybody who wanted to unmute and ask any questions um, but we'll just keep it to the last few minutes. I'm conscious you're sitting in Steve's studio well, at the moment as well. So a big thank you to Steve for facilitating this evening as well. It's a pleasure. Uh, but uh, and I'll tell you what, it, it, it's been a pleasure to do this. It really has, actually. I, uh, yeah. I, hope, I hope some of the future will involve sort of audio-visual presentation. Might be able to get good at it. <laughs> the video should be available within the next few days so if people missed any part of it they can catch up as well um, and there's lots of messages coming in saying good night from Cor de Jean in the Netherlands um, interesting presentation thank you for a really interesting presentation and particularly for the news on the N7 uh, thank you Jim excellent session thank you Jim for an excellent evening thank you Jim and everyone else for the interesting evening um, and lots and lots of messages coming in so thank you Jim it's been really really good thank you very much
Jackie, just for your information, at maximum, we had 178 in the room. Oh, Excellent. Yeah, that's really good. Um, and we always expect that some people might not get home in time and, you know, the fact they've booked is good. And I apologise, Arthur's just telling me that one of the slides may have said GMT, not BST. Um, so I will check the slides. Thank you, Arthur. Um, it's one of those things where we do need to just check whether we're on British summertime or GMT, because obviously our overseas members need to know what time to tune in. So thank you. Excellent. Anybody who wants to ask a question of Jim quickly before we close? Yes, yes I'd like, like to ask one. Um, he referred, we know that the O2 has gone off his catalogue, but that's a very, very recent lo loco. And I was just wondering why, because it is such a, a recent loco, that, you, that it's now gone out. Is it because some of the castings, which may have come from the G6, have actually sort of worn out? But no, no, the O2 is in, in the range. Oh, the O2 the O2 is very much a pride and joy of mine. Uh, well, that's, that's what I thought. That um, somebody said earlier that it'd gone off the range. No, the last loco that went out was the J50, the LNER J50. Right. Okay. Fine. Thanks, Jim. No, no, the O2. Can I ask a question, please, Jim? Can you hear me? Yes, certainly. Yep. Oh, yes, certainly. That's it. You're on screen now, Dan. Okay, I did ask it, but you didn't notice that. I asked about pocket money kits. What made a thing a pocket money kit? Presumably cheaper, but I mean, why were they pocket money oh, kits? Oh, true. Uh, uh, okay, okay, Dan, I hope Steve doesn't mind. Right, what, what happened was, many years ago, there was a, a television programme, a television quiz programme called Busman's Holiday, of which... They got teams from various different disciplines. Uh, so the cider makers have come along and put a team in, and uh, uh, the fencing instructors have put a team in. And there was a team of model railway uh, and that lot, uh, which I got collared to join, uh, along with Jim Harris and John Berry, or somebody else was uh, originally going in, but they, uh, they got cold feet, so I got collared into that. So we went and did this television programme, Busman's Holiday, uh, and that lot them. And the prize was you won a busman's holiday. So if you was, for instance, uh, marriage guidance counsellors, I don't quite why it worked like that, uh, who was the team that beat beat me, uh, uh, and that lot, you got a week, you got a week's holiday in Israel. So what that was. But if you were gonna be model railway men, you'd go and get a week's holiday in Switzerland, where, uh, a matter what, if you've got with us. But we didn't do it, so we never managed to get, get, get the free holiday out of it. And Jim Harris sort of said, well, I'll tell you what, Jim, we didn't get the holiday out of it. What about if we tool up nice and cheap what was sort of five wagon kits, which are five great Western wagon kits, produce a batch, uh, we had 20 sheets off and produced a batch, sold them at a Gildex, and we had enough money out of it to go on holiday. <laughs> and that's where it came from, because it, it was sort of, well, what name are we going to use? Uh, and it was, well, it's to do it, it's to provide us with some pocket money. So that's where, that's where pocket money kits came. But it was, and it sort of grew, and most of it's now either in my range and still in production. Uh, and sometimes, some of the etches, you'll still see pocket money you know, the original market of pocket money, uh, or there was long in the tooth and they've disappeared out of production. But yeah, that's where pocket money came up. So, so if we ever have another session uh, of that lot, I'll tell you the tale about Busman's holiday. Thank you very much. Oh, I've made one of them up, certainly. I've got another one yet to make. Actually. Oh, there you go. I'll, I'll tell you what, much sought after some of them are. Oh, well, no, I'll yeah. make it myself. I'll, I'll tell you what, if you've got a crocodile, the Great Western Crocodile, well wagging, you know, I'll tell you, I've been money changes happens for those. <laughs> I've got a, G6, a G6 in a pocket money kit, black box. You know, pocket money G6, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it costs you 50 quid. Some, I can't remember. And the price isn't on the box anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, the quality remains long after the price is forgotten. Oh. Oh, it's an absolute super kit to build. It really was. Yeah. Well, it's fascinating to know how they came about then. No? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Can you remember Colin Massingham and his El Crapo round? Oh, yes, very much so. <laughs> what it said on the tip. Yes. <laughs> but he always, okay. had a, he always had a new model on the market before anybody else. I'll tell you what, I, I've never seen anybody come up to Colin and say I was surprised with what, what I've got. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jackie. You're very welcome. Okay, um, thank you to everyone. I'm going to close the meeting now. And um, what I will do is make sure that I let everybody know via the forum as soon as the recording's available. Um, and as I say, Jim, thank you very, very much. It's been a really enjoyable evening. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I hope everybody has a good night. And uh, perhaps just yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Fascinating. Thank, you Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Brilliant, Jim. You take care. You too, Bob. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank welcome, you, Jackie. Thank you. You're welcome, darling. Thank you.